Hey everybody, welcome to the Senior Symposium of 2018. Today we have Blake Sutterfield presenting. Uh, he's going to be talking about the voice of the customer for small farm industrial hemp production in Virginia. Um, and his advisor was Dr. Nicole Radswell. Good luck. Thank you. All right, so as you said, I'm Blake, and I'll be showing you guys the BOC for small farm hemp production. Here's just a quick overview of the slides, basic you know, layout of the presentation. Um, I'm gonna go over a little bit of the problem statement first. Um, three of the main areas that I was focusing on, um, the first one being uh, the viability of industrial hemp as an agricultural crop for uh, farmers in Virginia. Um, and so what I mean by agricultural resource, you know, something that could just be grown and distributed commercially, um, something that just helps their business with crop rotation, stuff that just helps the farm in general. Um, I measured this by conducting two-way interviews with uh, the farmers with ideally less than uh, 300 yards or 300 acres rather of land. Uh, this was based on, um, I just found a few reference points for like how much farms made, which you can find that at the VDAX website. It'll show you like different levels of um, how much money certain farms make. And so 300 happened to be on the lower range, which is still a lot of acreage, but you can consider that a small farm. Um, so they were, that was conducted and then I was analyzing the voice of the customer, which I'll explain that a little bit later on, but it's essentially understanding what the customer is looking for within their product. Um, and then also along the way, barriers to entry and ways to mitigate them were found. And what I mean by barriers to entry, anything that stops a farmer from potentially growing industrial hemp, anything that just is disruptive to their process, and then ways to mitigate them being how to move forward. <laughs> so basically to start, um, what is hemp? Hemp, usually when people hear the term, they obviously, they corresponded with cannabis. So cannabis is the overall genus of hemp and it's hemp is a, a cousin to marijuana under the same genus as cannabis. So same genus, different species. Um, as you can see, this is this little graphic right here I got from the collective evolution.com. It just shows you a lot of the areas that it's dominant in if it could be grown um, domestically. So it's really good for paper, really good for food, not only for humans, but for animals, um, specifically the seeds. The seeds have a lot of nutritional value when ground up into like a whey, or what, excuse me, when ground up into a protein, for example, for, for workouts um, and stuff like that. It's also very good plastic. One of the most recent um, uh, things that I had seen, you can see it on Facebook sometimes floating around. There's like, you know, why do we have all the amounts of plastic that we have made out of stuff that's not hemp. Because when you create hemp plastic, you can have a biodegradable product that is thrown out of a window and it'll be gone in a month. Whereas the stuff that we have now, it you know, you throw stuff out into the ocean and it stays there. Just throw it out in the ground and it stays there. It doesn't really go away. So moving on, I'll go into a little bit of the current public policy as well. Um, so much of the, this is a little bit of the history. So for Hemp essentially was well known around like, or it's been around since about 8,000 years. Uh, 8,000 BC, we, we were able to find that um, it was an ancient village in current day Thailand. Uh, they were able to find uh, pottery that had rope around the edges, <coughs> which was hemp based. So they've been cultivating this stuff for thousands of years. Um, I believe it was actually the Netherlands too, around uh, eight, 800, 750 AD, um, most of the ships that were made um, by the Vikings and stuff in the Netherlands and the Norwegian provinces, they were all hemp based. So hemp has been around for many, many generations. Um, it first made foot in the US um, in the 1600s. James, this Jamestown civil, the Jamestown settlement was like one of the really big um, uh, tobacco industries for a little bit when starting, you know, the pretty much modern day foundations of America. Um, hemp was really big because it was used for crop rotation purposes. When hemp is grown, its roots pretty much delve deep into the, uh, I believe it's like four feet deep into the soil. 
and there it's able to stay there and kind of um, it just re it replenishes the soil by biodegrading itself and then creating biomass within the area where most of the stuff had gone. So that was a huge, it, that pretty much made it a huge staple crop for um, Jamestown settlements. Um, among the founding fathers that advocated for it, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, they all grew hemp themselves and they pretty much made this the staple crop that it was through the 1800s until the 1937 Marijuana Tax Act. Um, this came around due to reefer madness. I don't know if you guys are aware of that, but reefer madness was essentially the movement that demonized anything that had THC in it. So marijuana, no go. Um, this stopped anything from, this stopped everything being grown as well. So anything that we had been doing up to that point was now demonized and illegal. Not five years later though, after we banned the growing and commercial production of hemp, we get thrown into World War II. World War II, we have a lot of enemies. Uh, the Pacific, that was, you know, we had a lot of big battlegrounds out in the Pacific when island hopping. 90% um, of the ninety percent of the rope that was made with those rope nettings that our soldiers climbed and stuff, that was all hemp-based. That was all due to this campaign, uh, Hemp for Victory, which kick-started more hemp growing after it had just been banned. So, as you can see, it's the, the policy has been very wishy-washy, um, and much of the regulation that we base, much of the regulation surrounding industrial hemp today is because of political turmoil such as that. Um, so that's hemp, but what is an industrial hemp? Industrial hemp is a more solidified definition that just revolves around the commercialization or industrial processes that you could use hemp for. So. Um, if you're trying to, I'll step back a little bit. Um, current public policy allows Virginia, Virginia universities to grow hemp for research purposes. Um, one of the schools is obviously James Madison University and projects before me were searching for um, the viability for it to grow in the Shenandoah National Valley, um, you know, weather patterns that would affect it, would it be a useful commodity in Virginia. So it can grow. Now it's just a matter of what can we use the hemp for? Will it be useful? Um, as you can see here, there's, I have these few little graphics that show the stalk is good for making things such as concrete, insulation, bedding. Um, it's also good for shoes and bags. So already um, in an industry setting, a lot of people would probably want to try to find concrete if they're, you know, making houses. Well, we could switch. Um, we could switch some of the products to make the concrete more environmental friendly by taking a hemp route, for example. Um, commercially, if you wanted to create, if you wanted to create, again, like I was saying, a protein powder or something, the seeds would be a good way to. Pretty much, like you could, you could harvest all that stuff from the seeds. Um, so, again, the greatest thing about hemp is just how diverse the fields are that you can like pretty much market this stuff in. Um, so you could do it for, again, commercial or industrial purposes. Some more background. So again, 1937 Tax Act, that was the big, that was the big, you know, chopping the head off the snake, no more hemp production. Uh, and then in the 1970s, the Controlled, Controlled Substance Act actually labeled um, cannabis, all forms of cannabis as a Schedule One drug. If you guys aren't aware of the different levels of the schedules, you have Schedule One, Schedule Two, Schedule Three. Schedule Three being the least, um, you know, the least harmful, I guess, or the least, um, least to have adverse effects if used in a medical setting. Schedule Two, kind of the same thing, it's just the mid-ground. There are medical uses for it, but you're not gonna find it that often and then schedule one is there's no medical use for it it's just not it's not good for what we're doing um, so this is bad because THC obviously has medicinal properties and I'm not here to talk about that though but there were good things that we could use THC for mainly hemp only has CBD in it so as a 
as a commodity that's just based on the stalk and the leaves and the non-psychoactive properties, this is completely unfair because if they were worried about people becoming, I guess, high or the psychoactive properties of hemp, you would completely asphyxiate before you got any form of, you know, high from hemp. So this was completely unfair. But in 2014, Obama actually signed the U.S. Farm Bill that allowed for, again, as I was saying earlier, um, Virginia institutions were able to grow uh, hemp for research purposes. So this allowed for Virginia, UVA, Virginia State University, and again, James Madison University to grow hemp to see what the buzz was about. Um, most recently, actually, this month, um, if you guys visit the VDAX website, you can see that our governor, Ralph Northam, actually signed a bill, I believe it was House Bill 352, which expanded upon the current regulation that we, that we have for the hemp. Um, so you don't have to be part of a research institution. You can actually now go through an application process to be able to get your, to be able to get your licensing and then you can grow hemp for your own purposes. So, I mean, obviously, as long as you had a goal in mind and something that you feel would give back to the public, you, know, you have to have all this stuff set straight, but that just shows you that there are, there, there is more of a push to start recognizing the benefits of hemp in general. So for my methodology, I reviewed a few literature practices. Um, these are the main ones, understanding the lean voice of the customer, streamlining the voice of the customer, and beyond voice of the customer. Uh, I'll start just by defining the lean. Um, lean is a principle in marketing that pretty much, it, it makes customers the focus of an organization and it bases, customer, or it bases organizational success on uh, customer input, not necessarily feedback. So by that I mean, let's say you wanted to make um, you know, a better, a, a more chocolate or chocolate shake. Well, if you take the input from the farmers, how they make their chocolate shakes, and then you develop your own product based on that, that's using lean as opposed to, hey, this is my chocolate shake, what does it taste like? And then gathering data after that, that's just like market research. So the lean is paying attention to the customers. Um, and then again, voice of the customer is pretty self-explanatory. It's what's the customer saying? What are their concerns? How can we ask them a question that actually articulates what they're trying to tell us? Um, let me come back real quick. So for streamlining the VOC process, obviously today we have a lot of ways to reach out to people. Um, trying to find the best way to communicate with the farmers was a challenge just because a lot of the farmers, they're, they're set in older ways. Uh, at the same time, there are a bunch of new and upcoming farmers, which I'll get to that in a little bit, but figuring out how to get meaningful feedback from these farmers first, you know, you had to actually find them and figure out what they're up to. Um, so I was able to uh, use Facebook. Facebook was one of my big assets that I used. I found a group of these guys called Hay Kings, which was actually a collaboration of 16,000 farmers, um, not just in Virginia, but worldwide. So this guy was working with people in Australia and stuff. Um, but it's essentially just a community of farmers that were all working towards figuring out how they could better their operations and comparing their operations to one another. Um, and along with that, obviously, I was able to find phone numbers and I called people to figure out survey questions and whatnot. Um, so moving on, these are some of the questions that I asked the farmers. They were pretty basic. Um, you know, how many acres are on the farm? Uh, what is grown on the farm? What do you, when you hear the term industrial hemp, what comes to mind? Um, and then so on and so forth. Are you aware of how it differs from marijuana? Um, and would you consider growing industrial hemp? The, main questions that I focused on were uh, the acreage. Now, as I said before, um, the, some of the answers that I got from these farmers, their farms were a little bit above the 300 acre limit that I had originally set. However, I found this information that they gave me to be very useful because, well, I'll just, I'll show you a little bit. Um, 
So of the 17 her of the <coughs> April, uh, excuse me, through the dates of April 1st through 10th, I was able to call these farmers and reach out to the farmers on Facebook. Um, of those that responded, I had six responders, three from Harrisonburg, three from Charlottesville over the phone, and then the others were um, part of the Hay King Kings group from Facebook. But um, of the respondents that wanted to actually speak to me, there were uh, two that actually wished to remain anonymous, uh, which I found this funny because they actually were afraid of the stigma with marijuana, and so they didn't want to be named in the project. They were happy to participate, but it just shows you that there are people that still, when they hear cannabis or when they hear hemp, they just immediately assume, oh, this is about marijuana, and this is like a political kind of push, when it's not. It's just trying to figure out what do you guys think of it. So again, I find that very, very interesting that there are people that just simply don't want to give their opinion because they think it's, it aligns with something politically that they're against. Um, taking a step back real quick, part of this project also forced me, or not necessarily forced me, but it got me to uh, step out of my boundaries and figure out where can I find congregations of farmers. Um, one of the main conferences that I found to be very helpful was the 2017 Small Farmers Conference in Charlottesville. Um, this was a conference that offered a bunch of workshops for farmers to come in and figure out um, what can they do for their for next year's crop, how can they improve um, their current operations to be more organic. Um, it was just a lot of general farmer knowledge. Now, interestingly enough, me going to this conference, I figured it'd be pretty easy to ask the farmers questions, but it turns out farmers are being asked questions 24-7 throughout the year, and most of the time, they don't even want to be bothered. So um, one of the barriers to entry I found was, again, communicating with the farmers and figuring out how to garner a response from them that would be useful to me. Um, but again, so I went to this conference, and I actually attended um, a workshop um, for industrial hemp. Uh, via, uh, again, Virginia State University, they were one of the people that were uh, researching the viability of hemp in Virginia. I believe they were specifically focused on uh, the seed output, like how many seeds they were able to get, and specific properties of the strains that they had. Um, but one of the most interesting things that I found was, uh, by the name, the, the, the guy's name is Dr. Vitellis Timu. Very, very smart man. I was really happy to be able to talk to him about this stuff. But um, in passing, he just told me about how he noticed a lot of the issues with the outdoor operations was that the plots were becoming pretty much hosts to a myriad of different animal species. So animals and bugs, they were all starting to like pretty much fall in love with these, these hemp plots because of the amount of things that the hemp was giving it to them. It was giving to them, you know, the seeds. Um, they were able to have a place of shelter. The d bugs could just kind of like bury deep in. I think uh, Japanese beetles were were uh, a huge problem essentially for uh, growing hemp in Virginia. But again, I just find that interesting that even for something that's up and coming, there's all these barriers that you're going to find with growing the hemp. So outside obviously it's 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 nice to grow it outside but you're going to come across a lot of issues um, so again i called these people and this is so these are some of the most um, uh, interesting results i got um, so of this seven of the ten farms that i had talked to were less than 300 acres while three of the ten were uh, over um, of the seven, they all, uh, of the seven that had less than, they found it that it was impractical for their operation because most of the people that I was talking to, they had uh, two acres or less. So their operation was mainly for uh, growing a plot that they could create produce and then ship it out to, not ship it out, but distribute it at different local farmer markets. Um, so for smaller Virginia, uh, operations, it's just not practical for distribution within a farmer's market just because of how diversified that is too. 
Um, now, if there was a hemp market, then it might be easier for the farmers to just say, hey, I got you know, a couple acres, I can just grow this and then ship it off to find um, some use for it. But again, surprisingly, most of the farms that I talked to, they, didn't, they just didn't want part of it because it wasn't practical for their operation. And of the three that did say yes, they were very interested in the uh, economical implications uh, for hemp. So um, larger operations, obviously, you know, if you have 300 acres, you'd think, okay, they have their own organic processes. Um, they found that growing the hemp just for uh, commercial for for crop rotation purposes would be pretty much their uh, their go-to. Um, but again, it, that all depends on current regulation as well. So it's just trying to figure out how can we, uh, I guess, garner more clear regulations so that these farmers can understand what they can, what, how many plots they can buy, what they can grow, and how can it be profitable for them. Um, here's just another graphic that I had. This was based on, um, this is a word frequency chart that I did through R, which pretty much took all the answers from So that was just a word frequency chart that it took responses from what was grown on the farm and it pretty much just asked, um, the, the key purpose of that question was to figure out what most Virginia farmers are worried about growing or like what is their, what is their main forte. So again, as I said, that pretty much circled back to the whole farmer's market dilemma where most of these farmers are just growing for smaller operations. Um, sorry, my, my laptop died. So, it said it had two hours of charge on it and then can't even handle a 15 minute presentation. Perfect. But just trying to wrap it up at the end there, um, the word frequency chart shows you, again, what were most of the farmers focused on growing? Um, the most re the most abundant response I was getting was they were focused on their freshness, the freshness of their produce. Um, they were focused on growing organically. Uh, they didn't. Some of them didn't consider themselves uh, official organic processes due to, um, I guess, just the way that they have to kind of go through the game there. But most of them did say that they strive to. Good there. Most of them did strive to follow organic processes. I hope you guys aren't seizure prone. I'm very <laughs> sorry. This is, uh, I forgot my epilepsy warning at home. But, so, again, just to wrap it up a little bit, 50% of the respondents ended up having. Um, they associated with industrial hemp no negative connotations. Um, they just simply hadn't heard of hemp being tied to uh, uh, industrial hemp before. They hadn't heard that setting, but they were interested in um, figuring out what that meant for their farms later on in the future. Um, one of the farmers I even talked to, again, about growing it for their operation, they considered it to be a headache just because that was one of the specific terms they used was headache. Um, and again, it just tied back into the impracticality of their, of them growing hemp for their operation. But um, in conclusion, some of the ways that I was able to, or some of the barriers to entry that I ended up finding were again, lack of clear regula regulation and existing rules um, are very broad. The uh, limitations for some fa for the small farmers operations uh, included uh, high startup costs and um, growing hemp again was just impractical for them at this time. Um, and then outdoor operations uh, were very attractive to wildlife, and so ways to mitigate that I would consider growing uh, maybe in indoor operations or just fine tuning the way that 
um, the hemp is able to be reached by wildlife. Um, as far as limitations, I would say target larger operations just because they have the means to be able to grow the hemp, to be able to make it profitable for their operation. Um, and then as far as lack of clear regulation in the existing rules abroad, or the existing rules being very broad, I would just say um, if you consult, if you care enough about the subject, consult local government representatives. Um, try to push for hemp for your state because over, I believe it's 36 states already have some kind of industrial hemp regulation set in place. So um, it's a very exciting, very exciting time to be a farmer and um, thank you very much for having me guys. Uh, Thank you guys.